Welcome to EPG Parshala. I am Dr. Vishwajit Ghosh, Professor of Sociology of the University of Bardhaman, West Bengal. I will be talking today on an interesting agenda of social movement. The topic is Maoist Movements in India, Issues and Challenges. It comes under the paper called Social Movement within the broader framework of sociology. Now the objective of this module is to make you aware of the issues and challenges of Maoist movements in India. There are several factors that have dictated the contours of this movement. Obviously, this module would allow you to introspect into diverse structural and discursive conditions that have played the major role in collective action. They would also talk about the way uh, these actions have changed, taken different trajectories over time. Now, uh, the Nakshal and the Maoist movement in India, it would complete 50 years in May 2017. Obviously, I am referring to two movements. One is called Nakshal movement, the other is called the Maoist movement. There are questions about talking about two movements within a singular platform. But if you look into the issues of Nakshalites and Maoist movement, Obviously, you can trace different phases of these movements, but at the same time, the goal of this uh, movement and the ideology of this movement remained uni uniform throughout ages. And the uh, ideology is annihilate class enemies, create liberated zones and seize state powers through the barrel of guns. For what? To establish people's democratic dictatorship. So the political agenda of either the Nakshalite movement, which was seen during 60s, and the Maoist movement, which has begun particularly after 80s, remained the same. That's why there are arguments in treating both these movements within one folder. Now, to begin with, uh, the Nakshalite movement started particularly in a district called Nakshalbari in the district of Jalpaiguri in West Bengal in the year 1967. Now, there was, a, uh, there was an armed uh, resistance of peasants against the landlords. And obviously, there are revolutionaries who came from Kolkata to support the uh, movement. Uh, that, that peasant movement had issues like, you know, give us land, the ownership of land, and we are the owner, the tiller is the land. And obviously, that, you know, that in that process, many uh, zamindars and those who were uh, the holders of the land, they are being attacked personally. Now, in 80s, you know, uh, we, we are not discussing the Nakshalite movement in uh, totality, uh, uh, in detail, because of the reasons that Nakshalite movement, the old type of Nakshalite movement has already died down. But the, the resurgence of the Nakshalite movement in the name of the new Ma Maoist movement during 1980s is a matter of intense scrutiny for all of us. Now, we call it the second phase of the Maoist or the Nakshalite movement because in the 1980s, uh, the Nakshalites and the Maoists started participating in, uh, in parliamentary politics, in trade union activities, and all this democratic path became, uh, you know, more fruitful for them because there was so much of attacks on the Nakshalites during 70s, and there was almost you know, annihilation of the Nakshalites, you know, uh, by by police and paramilitary forces. So obviously, they thought that this is the best way. Some Nakshalites did one election, went to parliament and started uh, arguing there about the rights of the marginalized. Even though at one point of time, uh, they were very critical of uh, the parliamentary politi politics and particularly parliamentary uh, space. So, you know, stressing on mass mobilization could be the second phase. But in the third phase, from 2004 onwards, one sees a democratic, I mean, one sees the qualitative changes in the way Maoists are organizing themselves. In 2004, uh, the scattered and divided fractions of Maoists created a single revolutionary party called the CPI Maoist. Before that, there were so many fragmentations. In each state, there were this leader or that leader, and each fraction was known as this leader fraction, that leader fraction. That means CPI Maoist, X leader, CPI Maoist, that leader. These are the names of various fractions and various fractions have different tactics and ideologies. Uh, ideology is almost the same, targeting the, uh, you know, uh, uh, state and its agency, but there are different strategies. Somebody argued for parliamentary politics, somebody argued for different other tactics. But in 2014, four, 
when they came together and formed the CPA Maoist, they could, you know, uh, pose a pose a really serious threat to the state power for the first time in a country like India. The United Maoists were powerful to target uh, paramilitary and military forces to that extent that the government of India was forced to declare it as a red terror and uh, you know declare it uh, a sort of a threat to Indian security in May 2009. So probably in between 2004 and 2009, the Maoist became a threat to the government of India because of the activities that they could carry out in the hinterlands, mainly particularly among, uh, you know, in, in the tribal lands and particularly working among the Dalits. So if you find uh, that the Maoist trajectory is changing, you could locate that initially the Naxalite movement was concentrated mainly on the peasants, but now they are organizing the tribals in the tribal land, they're, they're fighting in the hinterland, you know, remote areas. They're also arguing for the Dalits. Now, many of the tribals and Dalits are also peasants. So, in that sense, there is continuity. Uh, in the way they're targeting the uh, security forces, in the way they're tar targeting the uh, uh, different rich classes or the, you know, powerful classes, there is much similarity in arguing that there is continuity of the Naxalite logic of movement even by the Maoist. Now, interestingly, despite the state declaring uh, it as a threat and despite the state, uh, you know, taking so many steps to counter the Naxalite hegemony, uh, there has been increase in the Naxalite affected districts in the country. In 1990, there were only 50 districts, but in 2015, the number of districts affected by Naxal Naxalism and Maoism has gone up to to 70. So many times, uh, you know, uh, increase in the number of Naxalite influence. Obviously, there must be certain reason for which Naxalites have been able to expand their horizon or reach out to the, uh, you know, impoverished tribals and marginalized Dalits. We need to look into these conditions and factors that have actually given, uh, uh, you know, uh, support to the Maoist movement. So the factors that influence the Maoist movement are very significant. We need to know the reasons for which Maoists have been able to, uh, you know, spread their wings. Uh, it's not it's not just talking about the way state is working. The way the Maoists have been able to uh, spread their influence, political and strategic influence, that should be sociologically explored. And this is one of the basic purpose of this module. Now, scholars studying Maoist movement have identified different different socio-economic uh, factors like poverty, inequality, deprivation, landlessness, lack of development, and want of primary services. If you enter into any space which is uh, under the control of the Maoist, you would be surprised to find that there is no resemblance of any state authority or any state services being provided there. So obviously, uh, you know, even during uh, the Naxalite movement, it was seen that the places where Naxalism grew, it was full of issues like alienation, uh, uh, unemployment, poverty, uh, uh, you know, deprivation and so on and so forth. So these social and economic issues did provide uh, a blanket sort of reasoning for the Maoists to organize the marginalized. Nandini Sundar, uh, a well-known sociologist, has categorized such a perspective as root cause perspective. That means she thinks this is one of the root cause of Maoist movement. Uh, many scholars, including Arunduti Rai, does feel that, you know, do feel that these perspectives of, you know, socio-economic stressing on the socio-economic factors is important. Even the government of India in its policies and perspectives stays on development and argue that if development takes place, obviously Maoism would see a day of the light. Now, in, in a different perspective, when I studied uh, ethnic movements, I also stressed on the social, social and economic uh, conditions of the marginalized people, tribals in particular, and uh, found that a particular kind of condition, which I termed as a necessary condition, which play a very vital role in explaining the origin of many social movements, including ethnic movements. So obviously, one can talk of necessary condition or root causes, which have influenced the uh, movements like Maoist movement. Now, uh, I, would, I would give certain examples to explain the importance of necessary condition. Maoist movement, uh, it has flourished in those reasons which are called as backward reasons. And these reasons are domesticated by tribals and Dalits. It cannot be a coincidence 
that Maoists are proliferating only in areas which are, you know, backward. Obviously, there is a, there is a connection between backwardness and Maoist operation. Secondly, is the, is the argument that, you know, uh, they, that this gap between uh, development and underdeveloped development, if it is breached, then, you know, the Maoist movement and activity and support would go away with. This argument follows from the logic that root, root causes or necessary conditions are the only condition which are actually giving rise to Naxalite movement. Indian state uh, strongly supports this logic and therefore it comes back with developmental project. But there are uh, uh, counter arguments too. One argument is, you know, despite uh, strong developmental activities in many parts of so-called Maoist affected area, Maoism did not die a natural death. The second argument is that, you know, poverty, deprivation, oppression, neglect, so and so forth, they are identified by Bandhubadhyay community, committee, which was uh, set up to look into the Maoist issue. They are present in many other parts of the country where Maoism did not grow. So, you know, the presence of inequality, poverty itself does not specify that Maoism will automatically grow in that area. According to Nandini Sundar, Javua in western Madhya Pradesh and Dandavada in Chhattisgarh, they share similar socio-economic conditions. So she is referring to two places, Javua in Uttar Pradesh, western Madhya Pradesh and Dandavada in Chhattisgarh. Socio-economically, they share same conditions. Yes, Dandavada is the heartland of the Maoist movement, whereas Javua is the site for a remarkable non-violent movement that is Narmada Bacha Andolan. So obviously one cannot argue that presence of or absence of developmental uh, you know yardsticks are the only criterion for the growth of Maoist movement. Maoists are absent in western India despite the fact that sizable numbers of Adivashis, poor Adivashis live there. So the root cause perspective fails to explain that why regions with better records of development witness growth of insurgent activities. So obviously, uh, if you look into tea gardens of Jalpaiguri, for instance, backward reasons, but you don't find Naxalites operating there. So you just cannot this, you know, argument giving that backwardness is the only reason. It's a false argument. It's a partial argument rather. Now the alternative explanation is, you know, Maoism is a kind of political protest. They are raising political issues. So whether development takes place or not, it, it hardly matters. They would rather put up a stiff political challenge to the ruling elites like landlords, capitalists, including the state, wherever they could. So this actually gives rise to the argument that Maoist movement is a political movement, it's an ideological movement. Obviously, one should not relate it only with this small and short route of developmental perspective. Another reason for the sustenance is that the very model of capitalistic development that the state has followed has given rise to that kind of marginalization. Uh, scholars have argued that state marginalized the process of, in the process of modernity, in the process of industrialization, in the process of globalization, there are vulnerabilities being created. So the very process of development in the contemporary period, in the new liberal policy, you know, liberal liberal age of globalization, many people are becoming vulnerable and victims of development process. So obviously, you know, the basic uh, structure of exploitation, if uh, it continues, if the basic structure of exploitation continues, uh, there will be some people to protest against it and some would take recourse to Naxalite movement. Obviously, the argument is, it's not that development is not taking place, but the kind of development take, taking place is marginalizing certain sections of people. So that actually is also giving rise to Naxalite movement and Maoist movement. So the point that is being argued is that necessary condition or the root cause perspective uh, is important to the extent that Maoists have proliferated in areas which are known as poor districts. But at the same time, Maoists have also proliferated in areas which are not so called poor or backward. And on the other hand, there are many districts which are poor, backward, but Maoist presence are not there. The kind of social movement that that has proliferated is of a different kind. Obviously, one needs to take recourse to other factors. And I would prefer to call them sufficient conditions in order to develop a theoretical paradigm. I would argue 
that along with the root causes or necessary conditions, there are sufficient or sociological conditions which actually give rise to uh, the sustenance of the Maoist movement. What are the, those uh, causes? First is an acute sense of discrimination felt by the people. People there must feel that there is an, uh, they are being discriminated. Then there is the rise of elite leadership, very strong elite leadership, which takes place only after a particular stage of development. Either it is a local elite or external elite. The role of elite is important and many theorists have stressed on the role of elites in uh, you know, organizing the non-elites. There is a political interest and manipulation. Many a group which organizes these people, including the Maoist and the Nakshal, they have a political interest. One may say it is a vested interest. Whether it is vested or not, that is a debatable thing because Maoists would argue that they are in fact organizing the tribals for their own benefit. That means they are organizing the marginalized. So one can argue that the political interest of the Maoists would in fact allow them to proliferate. it. Then there is the issue of state policy and action, the way state responds to a particular thing. Often it is, saying, it is seen that the way state responses, the way state replies to a particular moment, give rise to that particular moment, rather it strengthens. So instead of st state weakening a particular moment, state has rather strengthened many social moments. Then easy accessibility to external support. If you are able to gain support from external sources, if arms are supplied more easily, obviously your movement will be armed struggle. And then finally, there is a geographical location. Geographical location is important in the sense that all places do not give rise to Maoist movement. Let me now share the experience of Lalgar, uh, a district in West Midnapur, West Bengal, which became famous for Maoist activities in recent past. This undiluted forest area is occupied mainly by the tribal communities belonging to Santals, Bhumij, Shabar, along with OBC Mahatos. Now people here have very little land, in fact no land, uh, and very few enjoy political authority. The area is virtually uh, free, I mean, uh, do not have any irrigational facilities. The marginal economy is centered around collection of minor forest products. They rely on uh, the middleman to sell their product. So the middleman give them lesser prices. Obviously, unemployment is high. Uh, they go to different places to serve as occasional laborers. So this is the situation of absolute poverty uh, absence of state uh, benefits in the in the nature of healthcare or educational facilities that provided a ground for the Maoist to enter into Lalgor. So obviously this is the necessary condition which provided a reason for which Maoist uh, could enter into Lalgar. After entering into this, this area, the Maoists started arguing for the rights of the tribals. They started uh, demanding higher prices for the babui roop and uh, kendu leaves uh, in you know bans pahari area obviously in uh, you know in a fight between the armed uh, maoists and the middleman middlemen surrendered and they gave uh, gave them higher started giving them higher prices but you know the in several other places where the maoists operate in the country interestingly the immediate issues of the tribals and dalis are seriously uh, you know addressed through armed resistance so this modus operandi of addressing the immediate issue of the tribals in order to enter into an area, you know, establish them as a protector, which Arunduti Rai has argued that this has actually produced, uh, you know, a spectrum of resistance. So the Maoist armed struggle uh, has produced a spectrum of resistance because of this. But if you look into uh, the detail about the way in Lalgaard they have worked or in other places they have worked, you will be surprised to know that gradually, in fact, they, you know, uh, overturn themselves as a ruler of the tribals, they impose the decisions on them, and finally, the reasons of sufficient conditions that I have listed become more important in their sustenance. Let me now explain the role of sufficient conditions. I will also be using the Lalgor explain, uh, experience to explain it in detail. Now, an acute sense of discrimination among the youth was felt in Lalgar and many other parts of area where uh, the Maoists are operating. Tribals 
uh, you know, after uh, some bit of literacy, you know, tribal youth have started feeling deprived that state benefits are not really reaching them. So, Naxalites have been, uh, you know, uh, they are being, they are using this sort of uh, uh, state in order to romanticize the kind of ideology that once uh, they come to power or once the ruling classes are, you know, annihilated, there will be a land, there will be a there will be a country which will be bereft of any kind of exploitation. So often educated youth uh, who do not like to work in the forest uh, like that kind of, you know, that status of being called a terrorist or a uh, status of a police, uh, you know, on the basis of a monthly salary. So that kind of disillusionment uh, and, you know, fairy idealism has driven the elite, I mean, uh, the youth to join, uh, join the mainstream of uh, the stream of Maoist movement. So obviously the discrimination felt by youth is the reason. Secondly, the role of elite uh, due to modern education and middle class, right? Uh, many of the elites who are supporting the Maoist movement, who are working in the field, they are actually from urban area, uh, from Kolkata in particular, from uh, brilliant educational institutions like Presidency College, Adapur University. They are going there to support the, the movement launched by the Maoist in, uh, you know, that kind of situation. Obviously, one can argue that Maoist movement is in fact intellectually driven because many of the leaders are in fact intellectual, intellectual elites and they often also believe that, you know, they need to lead the people and it is often said that the Adivasis cannot represent themselves and they must be represented. Who would represent them? Obviously, these intellectuals, Maoist intellectuals feel that they are the best person to represent the interest of uh, the Maoist. So one may argue that uh, Maoist movement has become a uh, reality only after certain stages of development. Because with the growth of literacy, awareness and the growth of middle class, this has become a reality. Let us also look into the political interest and goal of the Maoist. The political interest of the Maoist is to capture state power and that overrides other kinds of interest. It is due to political reasoning that Indian Maoists have paid less attention to the identity question of the Adibashis. The ethnic movements which is proliferating in Northeast India is not giving any space to Maoists because Maoists haven't given in, uh, any importance to the identity question. Then, you know, the Maoist politics is critiqued by even intellectuals who support the Maoist because, you know, you put yourself on the heads of the people. You become the leader of the people and impose your, impose your decision and impose your political interest over the interest of the people at large. Interestingly, uh, when Maoists you know, enter into a particular area, initially they do not impose their political interest on the people at large. They rather fight for the uh, common masses. But when they uh, you know, ascertain, on, when they retain control and gain uh, the total control of the area, they started dominating the uh, tribals. There are instances where in Jangal Mahal, there is a fight between Santal community group and the Maoist leadership. So when the Santals started opposing, the Mahathos are being imposed, uh, Mahathos are being laid, made the leader of the you know, Maoist movement there. So questions are being raised uh, about the commitment uh, for the marginalized and a revolutionary ideology. Because if you are always for a political reason, and the reason does not always coincide with the issues that the marginalized people face, there will be obviously critic, uh, there will be obviously criticism of the strategies being, strategies being followed by the Maoist. Research has proved that there are interconnections uh, between politicians, private companies and Maoist operating in the hills. So the Maoist and non-Maoist forces, they have in fact, uh, you know, produced what is called, a, you know, conflict zone. So reproduction of conflict is a product of the interconnectedness of politicians, Maoist and private companies. There are questions of the fund being generated by the Maoist and the fund being utilized by the Maoist in order to develop the tribals. These are serious questions that Maoist need to address. The issue of state policies and action is also equally important. Now often it is seen that Indian state is always in a hurry to, you know, solve a problem. And obviously, if someone is in a hurry, he brings in a gun. So, 
that actually results in killing and violent suppression of any kind of voices. Now, Maoist armed groups uh, are being suppressed because you know they are arguing against the big businessmen and transnational corporations. So that kind of feeling, when it goes, obviously states start supporting the businessmen, big businessmen, and goes against the Maoist. The logic state fails to adhere to that the arguments of the common man should be listened to very carefully. Here, eminent sociologist Professor T. Q. Amin has argued that state, you know, does not take the justified demands of the minorities very seriously. In fact, they take it seriously only when that movement becomes anti-India or ethno-national or takes the terrorist shape. That means when it takes up gun. Interestingly, the Maoist threat is often used by the government to justify the rise of security-centric state and even to crush a popular democratic uprising. Ironically, cleansing operations by the state in the name of Greyhounds in Andhra Pradesh, Operation Green Hunt in Dandakarando, Salwa Jodum in Chhattisgarh have rather allowed the Maoist intellectuals and activists to gain fresh support and followers. It is an irony that the state starts confidence building only after it loses them or destroys them. So, therefore, uh, we need to take seriously the way state handles the situation and the way rather state complicates the situation. Let us now look into uh, the factor called outside support. Involvement of outside leaders, agencies has always been noted in many of the movements and particularly in Naxalite movement. The, uh, most of the leaders of you know, Maoist movement, they are all committed cadets from the cities. They are urban literate intellectuals from upper classes in many places. In fact, uh, one would not find uh, a, even a Dalit or a Harijan leader becoming a Maoist leader at the upper level. Many of the upper level leaders are in fact, they belong to the urban gentry. In case of Shingur and Nandigram for instance, Maoist came openly to support it, but they are all from urban area. So this outside support, uh, you know, uh, has put Maoist into problem because whenever the state is able to do away with that upper, upper uh, you know, that outside support and that strength of the Maoist, the movement faces a complete blackout. Uh, there are a number of in instances where the Maoist leaders uh, have often forced the tri local tribals and Dalits to accept their path of violence after they have been able to capture the territory. This is something called, you know, sufficient condition because marginalization alone do not explain the sustenance of the Maoist, Maoist movement. As a corollary, what happens is that the strength and zeal of the movement uh, vanishes rapid, rapidly after the surrender or death of a particular person. That has particularly happened in Lalgaur after the death of Kishanji namely Koteshwar Rao, uh, you know, Jangal Mohal does not have any strong Maoist presence today. Some of the interesting things that is happening so far as leadership is issue, leadership issue is serious. On the one hand, outside leaders, leaders dictate terms to the local people, the least of tribes. But on the other hand, if that leader, who is a political committed leader, uh, you know, either he is arrested or die, die, uh, he dies in a particular operation, that movement becomes very weak in that particular area. That has particularly happened in an area called, uh, you know, Jangal Mahal or Lalgor, where due to the death of Koteshwar Rao, uh, Maoists could not, in fact, build up a very strong uh, situation or a strong support base there. So the domination of the outside leaders bring in the hidden agenda of political agenda of the Maoist. Most importantly, the last factor is the geographical location. Now, it is not a coincidence that Maoists are operating in the tribal land. Now, their love for tribals is there because the tribals are marginalized, but tribals could be more interested in their identity. Maoists are not. So, obviously, in the 80s and 90s, state repression in the plains have actually forced them to enter into you know, uh, forest area. So, this is, uh, I believe, a technical kind of move that they are in a position to fight a guerrilla warfare only from a particular place 
which is covered uh, by forest. So that actually premeditated strategy uh, is a coincidence. It is not a planned political you know, ideology that Maoists will be protecting only the tribals. They are for a particular political ideology and that political ideology can be sustained in a particular environment called hilly terrain. One additional factor is that administration is very weak in hilly terrain, so it is very easy for the Maoist, uh, you know, to operate there. And as a result, most of the guerrilla insurgency activities take place in that area. So we see that uh, Maoist movement, uh, you know, are affected by different kinds of condition. We have already discussed the necessary condition, the root cause perspective, and the sufficient conditions six types of sufficient conditions. We may say that, that there are structural processes and disc discursive conditions. Structural processes are related to the socio-economic issues and discursive conditions are related to sociological issues. Since 1967, these issues have surfaced again and again. And as a result, you know, as a result of combined forces of these uh, developmental and sociological issues, Maoist movement has risen again and again in different shapes and color. It appears that in a country like India, uh, anti-state movement have their potential to crop up under different conditions with contrasting faces. So therefore, uh, you know, if the marginalization goes on, if large number of people are powerless, there will be many more to, you know, come in favor of that. There will be many more to fight for the rights of the marginalized. There is a, therefore a limit to counter-insurgency activities because you cannot just carry out a counter-insurgency counter activities unless and until the basic reasons, the sufficient and necessary conditions are seriously taken care of. So therefore, the possibilities of collective action in any moment, they are indefinite. Indefinite in the sense that they would go on multiplying from one place to another. In one phase, the character is X, the other phase, the character is Y. So since it is indefinite and you know they develop often in sequence one after another not that everything comes together it is up to the state and the intellectuals who are serious about the issues of Maoist movement to talk about and discuss these kinds of situationally contingent issues and you know think about the future of, uh, of a movement so that proper corrective actions can be taken unless and until such proper corrective actions are taken unless and until a new analysis of the reasons and the factors of Maoist movements are seriously taken care of, I believe there is no end to any kind of movement, including the Maoist movement. Thank you.